we are delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Dettol, Panega Swast India. This session is presented by the Hawthornden Trust. It is our pleasure to present today the Ottomans, Khans, Caesars and Caliphs, Mark David Bear, in conversation with William Dalrymple. Mark David Bear's radical retelling of the Ottomans challenges traditional notions of the vast Ottoman Empire, illuminating a cultural domain that was not the antithesis to the Christian European West, but its equal. In conversation with William Dalrymple, Bear unravels Western notions of sexuality, Orientalism, genocide, and history itself through the chronicles of a formidable world empire. Mark David Bear is a professor of international history at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He is the author of five books, including Honored by the Glory of Islam, Conversion and Conquest in Ottoman Europe, which won the Albert Hurani Prize. William Dalrymple is one of Britain's great historians and the best-selling author of the Wolfson Prize-winning White Mughals, The Last Mughal, which won the Duff Cooper Prize, and the Hemingway and Kapusinski Prize-winning Return of a King. His most recent book, The Anarchy, was long listed for the Bailey Gifford Prize 2019, among others. He is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, the Royal Asiatic Society, and the Royal Society of Edinburgh and was presented with the prestigious President's Medal by the British Academy for his outstanding literary achievements and for co-founding the Jaipur Literature Festival. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comments section. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Please tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2022 and tag at Jaipur Litfest. Ladies and gentlemen, the Ottomans, Khans, Caesars and Caliphs, Mark David Bear, in conversation with William Dalrymple. Mark, welcome to the Jaipur Literature Festival. Uh, your book was one of my uh, absolute top reads of last year. Uh, and um, I, I, bizarrely, I read it in uh, Java um, and uh, was very surprised to discover that the Ottomans uh, reached even as far as the uh, uh, as those those distant uh, Indonesian parts, um, and so I'd love to talk to you in a second about about that. But let's focus first of all uh, on the field itself. Why do you think uh, that so little has been written in English about the Ottomans compared to say the Mughals uh, or any of their other contemporaries? Well, thank you for having me at the at the festival. Even if it's virtual, it's a, it's a pleasure to uh, to be in conversation. And um, the Ottomans we'll another year in person. But they're not going to let you off the hook, Mark. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. So the the question has to do with um, with why so little has been written about the Ottomans. Well, actually, a lot has been written about the Ottomans, but so little has been written by experts. And this is one of the problems. And and one of the reasons I wrote the book was that the last time uh, an Ottoman expert, someone who reads Ottoman, had published a, a, a readable narrative of the entire Ottoman dynasty's history was over 15 years ago. So I thought it was time to, to put my research and, and, and other, late, other people's research into a synthesis to tell the story. One of the reasons is linguistic. And to do Ottoman history properly, one, has it's the Ottoman language is not simply old Turkish. The Ottoman language is a unique language. It's distinct, although its component parts are Arabic, Persian, and Turkish. So one really has to um, be trained in Ottoman, but also to to know these other languages. So mostly I rely on chronicles, and the chronicler may be writing along in perfectly understandable Turkish although obviously in the Arabic script, but then he'll want to quote a hadith uh, from Muhammad. So this will be in Arabic. So you have to be able to read that as well and, and figure out why he's inserting it. Or when he's really excited, the chronicler will add a couplet in Persian, in Farsi. So many historians actually skip over these bits, but I find you know these, these poems are ex very expressive and important to include. 
And the, the top Cappy archives are, are famously difficult to access, aren't they? I mean, many, many uh, researchers over the years have had their requests turned down, particularly for sensitive documents uh, towards the 20th century. Have well, you had trouble little... getting, getting access, or has it taken many years to really get in there? I had difficulties, as uh, everyone had difficulties, I began researching in the 90s. And the first time I, I went to Turkey for research, I had um, 12 months of time, but it took nine months for me to get clearance in order to enter to, to do my research, because I had to get clearance from the internal ministry and the cultural ministry and the foreign ministry. So, and they're also, they are also um, in the 90s when I began researching, and today there were political difficulties. So for example, in the prime ministry's archive at that time, it may be different now, I haven't been there a few years, but in the 90s, there were all the catalogs were on one wall where you could look for you know, what was available. But then on the far wall with cameras on it were all the files about the Armenians. So if you, if you wanted to research the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, you'd have to cross the room and be on camera and look through the catalogs there. So, of course, there, there are difficulties, but there's also pleasures. Of course, there's great pleasures in conducting research in Turkey and the different libraries and archives in which I worked. The, the, the archivists were, were incredible people. Um, many of them were incredibly knowledgeable and um, gave great insight into the decontextualized text I might have been reading. I used to work a lot with the um, uh, flautist uh, Kutsi Egune, uh, and Kutsi was very angry um, 10, 15 years ago that um, there was no proper archiving of Ottoman cultural uh, uh, manuscripts, that he said that, the, that a lot of the musical notation and so on was left to rot, and that the uh, legacy of Ataturk, who had been so embarrassed about the Ottoman, had meant that, uh, that, that a great deal had been lost. Uh, is that your experience working in, in more political areas or, uh, or, or is that something that just reflects his particular um, cultural world that he, that he as a, as a, a Chelebi flautist, uh, a nay player, um, uh, had to face? I'm not, I can't comment on what he's faced, but it's true that Mustafa Kemal Ataturk sent many tons of, what well, the rumor is, he spent, sent many tons of Ottoman documents um, to Bulgaria to be, you know, turned into pulp, basically, um, because Ataturk in the early Turkish Republic turned their backs on the past. But in the past 20 years with the current regime um, in Turkey, of course, we have something different. Um, the current regime in Turkey uh, views the Ottoman past as something very positive, uh, a time when um, in their view, Muslim Turks were very powerful and very cultured and, um, you know, very, very impressive, um, had a, a very impressive empire. So in the last 20 years, there have been not only new um, television series, of course, you've heard about, you've seen about the Ottomans, but also there's Ottoman restaurants serving Ottoman cuisine. And there's also a lot more people who are studying, Turkish people who are studying um, the Ottoman language. And so, you know, there's a lot of work being done in Turkey, um, a lot of translation and transliteration of Ottoman text. But again... And has that made um, it easier or more difficult for you um, on balance? Oh, well, it, 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 again, it depends on what you're researching. So if you're researching the 16th century, then um, you'll be treated with, with great um, respect as someone who can read these, this, this old material and as someone who's writing about a, a, a glorious time period. If you go to Turkey to research the Armenian genocide, well, it, it's going to be a different story. And, and you're still these days blocked from, from those files with the cameras on them, which you described. Well, I haven't, I haven't tried. I haven't tried. But there, there were documents I was not ever given um, that I tried multiple times. Um, there was a register of church properties uh, in Istanbul from the 17th century. So not even recent, but, but the fear was that a foreigner would come in and um, look at where churches used to be and then make demands today for reparations or, or, or what have you. Um, of course, that wouldn't be my interest at all. I was trying to literally map out the neighborhoods of 17th century Istanbul. So given that most of our audience uh, are from India and, and, and perhaps don't, aren't aware of the, the, the full geographical extent of, uh, 
uh, the Ottomans at their peak. Do you want to just give a, a, a brief sort of pen portrait or a, a verbal portrait of um, the extent of the Ottoman Empire at its peak during Suleiman the Magnificent or uh, Sokolu Mehmet Pasha? Well, where, where are we talking? What's the geography here? Well, in the 16th century, uh, the Ottoman Empire is a, it's an Afro-Asian European empire. So uh, let's say at the time of Suleiman in the, in the middle of the 16th century, the Ottomans are controlling Hungary. They're able to besiege Vienna. They can't take Vienna, but they're that far west. They also are controlling Yemen. They're controlling much of North Africa, excluding Morocco, but east of Morocco. Much of that is either in the hands of Ottomans or Ottoman uh, representatives and allies. As I mentioned, they're ruling Egypt. They're ruling the Islamic holy um, places in, 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 in the Hejaz, so Mecca and Medina. They're also ruling Syria. They're also moving into um, what is southern Russia. They're also um, as far east as they've conquered Baghdad. They also, I mentioned Yemen, they are launching their navy um, regularly into the Indian Ocean. And this is something for the audience to, to consider. The Ottomans are actually an, an Indian, you know, a, a major player in Indian politics. There are Ottoman Muslim merchants who are in Western India, uh, in Gujarat and so on, in Surat. And they are, they are there, they are there um, engaging in trade, they're residing in Western India. The, Ottoman is all, the Ottomans are also sending their navy um, to battle uh, the Portuguese in the Straits of Hormuz and in the Indian Ocean. And the Ottomans also are sending arms east and west. So as far east as Indonesia, they will aid the different Muslim kingdoms there against, the, against, um, the, uh, against their opponents. In the West, the Ottomans are allies with Britain and France against the Habsburgs. So the Habsburgs are controlling what is today the Netherlands. And the Netherlands are going to begin with the Reformation to revolt against the Habsburgs. The Ottomans will send guns and promises of, of naval campaigns um, to help the Protestants. So this, this gives you an idea. The Ottomans in the 16th century also will plan to build the Suez Canal. They also will plan to connect the Don and Volga rivers in southern Russia. They won't succeed, but this gives you an idea of where they ruled and what their world vision was. And uh, this is this is what just before the Mughals have got themselves fully established, and then into into the Mughal period. So, sort of late, uh, to put it in Indian terms, late Sultanate, uh, and and then the full the full range of. Uh, uh, of, of the Mughals. So they both precede and, and survive longer than the Mughals after, uh, after 1858. That's correct. And, I, and, and you know, the Ottomans, the Ottomans are engaged with diplomacy with the Mughals. Um, between them is the Safavid Empire. It, this is the rival. This is the Shi'i Empire that the Ottomans face for, for, for two and a half centuries. So there will be diplomatic exchanges with the Mughals. There's certainly extensive trade across the Indian Ocean between the Ottomans and the Mughals. But in the chronicles that I've read, there isn't really much mention of this other than when the Mughal ambassador will come and the gifts he'll bring. There's one story in the 17th century, the Mughals send an elephant and his trainer but the trainer dies. The Ottomans don't know what to do. <laughs> they don't know what to do with the elephant. Um, you know, it's a different kind of different kind of animal. It, it's a very controversial matter in India at the moment about um, the relations between Hindus and Muslims under, under the Mughals. How oppressive in terms of religious um, uh, uh, enforcement were the Ottomans to the minorities living under them, particularly, I suppose, the Christians, the Jews, uh, and, and, and Muslim minorities such as Shias? Well, it's a, it's a very important question. And in the early centuries, I like to say that the Ottomans were tolerant. They were tolerant of Christians and Jews, but by tolerant, I mean tolerant in the medieval sense, that they allowed them to live and live according to their, their religions and, and, and they, were, they were safe and they were relatively free to practice their religion. So that's what I mean by tolerance. I don't mean that Muslims, Christians, and Jews coexisted. I don't mean to say that Christianity and Judaism was seen, were seen as valid uh, religions. In the law court records, they speak of Christianity and Judaism in disparaging ways as false religions, but Christians and Jews were 
given a place, they were tolerated, they're allowed to live. And this is in great contradistinction to, for example, how, how Jews were treated in the rest of Europe at the time. But as time progressed, go ahead. Jews were thrown out of uh, uh, Andalusia uh, by, the, uh, by the Spanish. Um, they're given shelter in Salerno and elsewhere in the Ottoman Empire. That's right. Most of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews would go first to Morocco, then to the Italian city states, and then to the Ottoman Empire, where they would thrive. And many Jews who were forcibly converted to Catholicism in Spain and Portugal would return to Judaism in the Ottoman Empire. And because of this, this is why even today Jews have a very positive view of Turks and of the Ottomans, because, because Ottoman Jews themselves and Mediterranean Jews um, celebrated the Ottomans for the fact that they allowed that refuge when the rest of Europe, including here we are in England, even England expelled the Jews. The Ottomans let them in and let them thrive. So that's something that's an important aspect. So this was the tolerance I'm speaking of. But nonetheless, they were regarded as dimmi. What, what, does, it, what does that mean in, in practice? Well, uh, there is a legal status. So legally speaking, in Ottoman society, men had more rights than women. And Muslims had better rights than Christians and Jews. And free people had rights that slaves didn't have. This was a hierarchical society. So that's what I mean. It was a tolerant system, but everyone had a place in the hierarchy. Now, this would change in the 19th century when the Ottomans got rid of the hierarchy, made everyone equal, but then they also lost tolerance, which led to the first massacres of Christians in Ottoman history in the late 19th century when Armenians are being massacred. We'll, we'll head on to the Armenians later, but just um, give an impression still of uh, at the peak of Ottoman power. In your book, you talk a lot about the how the Ottomans are very much part of the age of discovery. Normally, we use that in, phrase in Europe as a, uh, as, as a sort of uh, synonym for the colonial uh, explorations of, of, of the Portuguese, then the Dutch, then the British and the French. Uh, but you include the Ottomans in that, uh, that they are part of that uh, discovery of a wider globe. What do you mean by that? Well, I also include the Ottomans in the Renaissance, because the Ottoman uh, rulers, such as Mehmet II, the conquer, conqueror of Constantinople, was a Renaissance prince in every way. I also include the Ottomans in the Age of Enlightenment, because the court of Ahmed III in the first half of the 18th century was a place where Christians and Muslims got together and engaged in some of the same discussions and engaged in some of the same scientific experiments as we see elsewhere in Europe. So likewise, I also see them as players in what is called the age of discovery or the age of exploration. Now, this doesn't mean that the Ottomans are launching expeditions to the new world, but that, that's, that's, what, what it means is that the Ottomans were naval power. You actually get in touch with Queen Elizabeth and suggest a joint colonization project of the New World, don't they, at one point? Yeah. And they also are very keen to follow all the new uh, insights that the Spanish and Portuguese explorers are discovering. So they, they, have, the only, they have the oldest existing map of the New World, um, the Piri Raiz map. The, you know, this is, this is, this is, they also, they copy, they get a copy of Magellan's map. So they're very curious, very um, curious about what's happening in the world. And they're, they're, they're naval players. They're, they're battling. We can't talk about the Portuguese, the age of discovery, without talking about the Ottomans, their main rival. That's a, a, a contrast with the view of the Ottomans put out by Bernard Lewis, who, who used to um, uh, characterize them as, as militarily powerful, but, but basically intellectually incurious. And, and, and he contrasts them with European powers who, who we, he portrays as being uh, very scientifically interested. Why, would, why do you disagree with Lewis here? And what's the evidence that, that the Ottomans engaged in, in intellectual inquiry? Again, this, this is a debate here that many Hindu scholars um, often, often like to make the impression that the Mughals were intellectually incurious compared with, with earlier dynasties. Um, well, these are, why, these are stereotypes. Why, why, say again? These are stereotypes, aren't they, yeah. about Muslims? So, so, so tell, us your, tell us your view and, 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 and what's the evidence for, for scientific inquiry in, in Ottoman lands? Well, again, if we go to the, the court of Ahmed III, who ruled from 1703 to 1730, and we look at the, the men at his courts, and we look at the treatises they wrote, and we look at what the chronicles say about them, 
and we look about what they ordered from France. So they ordered, you know, the latest scientific experiments, um, equipment, sorry. And they, you know, they, they, they are also are, you know, it's also an enlightened court. And, and you only have to read the Ottoman uh, chronicles to understand that. But this material is, is so often not read. You know, what we read, you know, if we only read the English language and French language and Portuguese and Spanish material, then we'll, we'll miss all of that. Or if we think of a figure like Mehmed II being a Renaissance prince, again, this is, um, this is something that was well known at the time, in the middle of the 15th century, but has been forgotten today. Why do you think Bernard Lewis had this impression of, of, of intellectual curiosity? He was almost, Said des described him as, a, uh, as almost a sort of uh, uh, an active agent against his subject, that he was, he was mm. uh, trying to diminish the, uh, the Ottomans. Is, is that your impression? Well, he would. He was similar to you know. There, there, there also were modern Turkish historians uh, that Lewis was imitating, who also saw the Ottomans as as all these negative attributes, you know, incurious and 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 and, and so on. So Halil Enalcik, for example, was a, was a is he passed away a few years ago, but a, a very well esteemed modern historian of of the Ottoman Empire, and he wrote in a very similar vein to Lewis. Um, it's just that he was, a, he was, you know, there's, there's Orientalism in the Middle East and there's Orientalism in the West. So, you know, so these, these stereotypes are, so Lewis would take one example, or Enalgic would take one example. The Ottomans had built this splendid observatory. And then a few years later, this is in the 1580s, it was, it was torn down. It was demolished, rather, by a, by a mob of, of soldiers. So then he takes this one episode to be an entire indictment for Ottomans and for Muslims, uh, rather than just seeing one episode in different, you know, court factions coming to power. The, the other thing that's often quoted, and I saw some people quoting it in the comments underneath my review of your book, was the, the, the about the printing press, the Ottoman suspicion okay. and the Mughal suspicion of, 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 the printed, uh, of the printed word. Talk about that for a second. Well, again, it has to, we have to think about the Ottomans as not just being Muslims. So, if we talk about the history of printing in the Ottoman Empire, then it goes back to the 1490s, because the first printing press was a, a Hebrew language press that, right. um, you know, the 1490s, there were Christian presses, there were Greek and Armenian presses as well from those early periods. So if we talk about Ottoman printing, then yes, the Ottomans had printing. The, the language of the books would be, you know, um, Hebrew and Greek and Armenian, but why do we not include those? Now it's true that Muslims didn't print. It wasn't the really sensation this was being done covertly, uh, you know, avoiding government uh, inspectors or so on. This was open. Yeah, and they have the Ottoman imprint. No, of course yeah. not. Of course not. Now the Ottomans would begin to um, the, the the first printing press. Then is in the early 18th century. Again, that same enlightened ruler Ahmed the Third, and they're printing secular works. Um, they're they're printing you know all kinds of, of of material. So, but again, why does that have to be an indictment? Why can't we just see this as something? You know, there's again there were different groups in society that were opposed to printing because they didn't want to be thrown out of work because the, you know, you could talk about this, this class of, of, of scribes being very powerful. We don't have to make it an entire uh, religious or cultural indictment. Right. So it's like, if you like, the calligraphers trade union, is it, that are opposing it as much as the others. <laughs> I love that. So um, we, we, we touched earlier on the fact that the Ottomans e expanded into the Indian Ocean. Um, now, in your book, you said, which I hadn't really uh, taken in, that they actually uh, are engaged militarily on the coasts of India before the Mughals. Um, I mean, which leads to a great sort of what if. I mean, could, could the Ottomans have, uh, have, have, have taken military possession of the parts of the Indian coast like the Portuguese did? I mean, they could have had, um, they could have had forts and they could have had, you know, uh, garrisons, but, uh, but nothing more than that. There were limits to Ottoman expansion, technologically speaking. They could they could besiege Vienna but could never conquer it. They could take Tabriz in Iran, but they couldn't stay there. So there's sort of a maybe a 1,800 kilometer uh, point ap after which they couldn't. Now, um, but they could they could they have these bases. Daman and Diu. I'm sorry. They do attack Daman and Diu. What's yeah, going they on? Do. They do besiege. I mean, they do. You know, they are because of those uh, besiege those those military maneuvers. They are able to conquer. Aden and, and Yemen. 
Um, and, and so, so, you know, so they're not always successful. Again, they don't actually build the canals that they conceive of, of building. But if we think of the Ottomans as Indian Ocean power, it takes us away of thinking about them only as a, as a land power, as they're often written about. And we even have a, is it an Ottoman shipwreck or an Ottoman embassy at the court of uh, uh, Humayun? Um, one, of, one of the Ottoman admirals uh, comes to Agra, I believe. Is, is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and so this is just, this is just an example. Example that the Ottomans, there are even, there are Muslim um, kingdoms uh, in South Asia that are reading the Friday prayer in the name of the Ottoman Sultan. Even though the Ottoman Sultan is not physically possessing that land, they're actually, they're actually um, referring to them. Even in China, it says in one 16th century chronicle, um, is the Sultan's name read at Friday prayers? The Ottomans obviously don't possess any territories in China, but the point is that when the Muslims need a powerful uh, leader to refer to, they refer to the Ottoman Sultan. And Tipu Sultan, even as, as late as the 1780s, sends a, an embassy, doesn't he, to, to Istanbul to try and help get help against the East India Company. Right, right. So we, we should envisage these not as, uh, as exclusively a European or a Middle Eastern power, but one that absolutely touches this part of the world too. And that's why in the book, I talk about the Ottomans, their, 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 their Byzantine Roman heritage. That's why I talk about their Turkic and Mongol heritage. And I talk about their Islamic heritage. That's why the Ottoman sultans from Mehmet II, who conquered Constantinople, called themselves by all these titles, Sultan, Khan, Caesar, all the above. That's how they envisioned themselves. And, it, and, and today we, we've, we've forgotten about that. And that's why we try to write about it in the book. There is this very long period that traditional historians talk about Ottoman decline, but they still remain a major power right up until the, uh, the, the mid 19th century. And this, this word decline comes about because there were a lot of Ottoman intellectuals in the late 16th and early 17th century who, who were saying, who basically wrote treatises saying everything's going wrong and everything's falling apart, and maybe it's the women in, in the palace, or maybe it's the Turks joining the militia. Uh, there are different reasons for it. So modern scholars like Bernard Lewis took these, these lamentations at face value and didn't, weren't able to see that these were people with power who were losing power. The empire was transforming. There were new groups arising, new sources of wealth, new wealthy people, also new military formations, more provincial autonomy. So the, the empire was transforming, but modern scholars have seen those lamentations and said, oh, this is decline. But by the late 19th century, you have ideas of European nationalism uh, coming into um, the peripheries of the Ottoman Empire and, and areas such as Greece and Bulgaria um, uh, beginning to uh, see independence movements. What's going on there? Right. And if we think about the Ottomans, I mean, until the middle of the 17th century, they're expanding. Uh, even in the 17th century, they'll conquer Crete, they'll conquer parts of Poland and Ukraine. So until the middle of the 17th century. By the end of the 17th century, Crete, I, think, I believe is, is Muslim majority right up until uh, 1914, isn't it? Uh, Crete, right? Yeah. So then um, after this, the, um, by the end of the 17th century, however, Ottoman expansion has ceased and they begin to have more peaceful relations with the rest of Europe. And so that's why relate, the view of Western Europeans of the Ottomans will change and they'll begin to see the Ottomans in the 18th century as paragons of, of, of culture and pleasure and so on. That's why we'll have the tulip craze and all these sorts of things in the 18th century. But moving into the 19th century, the problem is for the Ottomans is that the, as you mentioned, the rise of new powers. The, the worst enemy of the Ottomans, though, is Russia. So Russia will rise in the 18th century. The Ottomans and the Russians will, will battle, I don't know, eight or nine times. The Ottomans will seemingly always lose. And so they're beginning to lose territory as we move into the 18th and 19th century, especially to Russia, an aggressive Russia. Now, where once the Ottomans claimed to be Caesars and where once Mehmed the Conqueror launched an invasion of Italy to conquer Rome, now it's Russia who says, actually, we're the new Romans. We're gonna bring the Byzantine Empire back to life. So that's the real threat. And the Ottomans will be allies of Britain and France, uh, sometimes enemies, sometimes allies um, in this period. 
So during the Crimean War, you have British troops uh, stationed in Istanbul and Scutari while, while they are fighting the Russians in the Crimea. That's right. The, the Ottomans will, will, will suffer huge losses um, on the side of, the, of Britain and France um, against Russia in the Crimean War. And even at, it, during the First World War, when this whole system is beginning to, to, to crumble, there is still significant Ottoman resistance and, and Indian armies sent uh, into what's now Iraq, into Qatar, and so on, are defeated. Just um, uh, a few uh, m uh, miles from where I'm sitting, there's a, there's a, a war memorial uh, in Meroli uh, to Indian troops um, killed at the Battle of Qatar. Uh, what's all that about? Well, the, the Ottoman entry into the First World War on the side of Germany made the First World War into a truly global war. The Allies, the French and British, thought that they could knock the Ottomans, they could take Constantinople. They, they launched this invasion of Gallipoli. They would quickly take Constantinople. They could end the Ottoman dynasty, and then they could um, speed up the end of the war. Well, they were wrong. It ended up being a very long siege, costing the lives of 800,000 men who were wounded or killed, but the Ottomans resisted. The British and French weren't able to take Gallipoli. What this led to then was the continuation of the war for several more years, massive casualties on both sides. The, the Ottomans fighting, as you mentioned, the British in Iraq. These, there's a massive use of, of Indian soldiers, especially in, these, these, in the Iraqi campaign. And in Palestine, at the end, you get, uh, did you get a, a Rajputana cavalry charge uh, in, uh, uh, on the plains of Gaza? Uh, That's right. It's truly a global war involving uh, colonial soldiers from, from Africa and Asia. Uh, in this, it's not simply a, a European war at all. Now, if you go to the Imperial War Museum here, um, you know, the, the very first uh, room, you get, the, you get the, the trench warfare, it's really quite overpowering. But there is also trench warfare in the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottomans actually suffer proportionally uh, greater losses than, than even France, because they had the war, they had disease, and then they had a genocide against their own Armenian population. And you even get um, a, a, a Russian army freezing up in, uh, uh, in Erzurum and uh, up, up in the uh, northeast. Of well, the Ottoman army, the Ottoman army, 80,000 men f freeze to death or are killed by enemy fire uh, at the Battle of Sarakamush. It's devastating. Um, and it exposes eastern Anatolia to uh, Russian, the thing that they, they always feared, Russian occupation. So the First World War is devastating for the empire. So you mentioned the, the Armenian genocide. Uh, what um, what's going on there? Why, after you, you portrayed the Ottomans as a uh, as, as a basically tolerant power who let the the different minorities get on with their own affairs and, and self govern, even if there isn't uh, equality, uh, why suddenly do you get a massive massacre of, of some say 1.5 million uh, Christians during the uh, First World War? Well, the the for the early centuries, the Ottomans are tolerant. And that's when there's this hierarchical system, um, a legal system, where Muslims are superior to Christians and Jews. In the middle of the 19th century, they move to a system of equality. They remove the hierarchical system. So now all subjects of the Sultan are, by law, are equal. Well, the Ottomans also move away from tolerance at the same time. So they bring in equality, they move away from tolerance, and that's why you have massacres of Armenians. You mentioned nationalism earlier. So from the time of the French Revolution, from 1789, the idea of nationalism will infiltrate and come into the Ottoman Empire and different peoples will, will take it upon their shoulders to become, to, to be their own rulers. And the Turks are, Turkish nationalism is later than the other nationalisms. So, so the Greeks and the Serbs in the early 19th century will um, uh, seek and gain autonomy and independence through, through, through um, rebellion and, and, and warfare. So the idea of nationalism will also be used by the dynasty, a kind of an Ottoman nationalism. Uh, the idea that every subject of the Sultan, as long as they're loyal, um, is, is, um, is equal and is part of the Ottoman nation. But this is competing with the other nationalisms, the Greek and the Bulgarian and, and the Kurdish and so on. Um, and the Armenian nationalism is also, also grows in the 19th century. And there are Ar Armenian political movements. There are also are Ar Armenians who demand independence. And um, out of all the nationalist uh, movements, it's the Armenian 
that causes the greatest um, paranoia um, at the center. Perhaps because... Because they're most numerous or...? Uh, I mean, it, it becomes a, a kind of a conspiracy where every time there is a rebellion and the, the, the authorities crush it, they believe that, you know, the entire population is going to rebel and not just those re rebels in certain towns in the southeast. They begin to suspect all Armenians, uh, men, women, and children, of being traitors um, and not just those those guerrillas and, and revolutionaries. And so they seek to punish, under cover of war, the entire Armenian population. So first of all, you get dep deportations down to the southeast and down to Aleppo out of the, uh, out of the way of the Russian armies, effectively. Right. Well, first, what they do is they, they, they arrest all the intellectuals in Istanbul and the three or 400 leaders of the church and the writers, and there are two women included, and almost all of them are, are murdered. So they cut off the head of the, of the nation. And then they... Um, they take all the Armenians who are in the Ottoman army and they, they demob them and they take their weapons away from them and they either kill them outright or work them to death um, in labor camps. So after the intellectuals are gone and the men are gone, then they go after the elderly, the women and children. Those are the people who are deported. Um, and they either die on the way to Syria or they're killed um, within a year after they're in the camps in Syria. And what's the relationship of, of Ataturk to the, these young Turks who are uh, uh, in charge of these deportations and, um, uh, and, and the massacres? Well, Mustafa Kemal is a, is a late Ottoman military officer, and he's trained in all these new military academies, and he is involved in all the revolutionary organizations that, that actually do depose Sultan Abdul Hamid II in 1909. He's part of all that. He comes from Salonika, which then was an Ottoman city, which was the heart of the revolution. And he's a military officer. And he is, plays an important role in the Balkan Wars, plays an important role in the putting down rebels in Libya. And in the First World War, he was the one who led the defense of Gallipoli. Now, uh, so he's, he's, he, in other words, is part of the same generation. And he's, in, he's together with all these men who are, who are, who are ruling at the time. Now, during the genocide, we have not, um, there's no evidence that he played a role in the genocide or that he was anywhere where genocidal acts were occurring. There's no evidence of that. Um, after, but, but after the war in 1918, when the Ottoman, what was left, well, the empire was occupied by foreign powers, Istanbul was occupied, the Sultan was doing the bidding, it seems, of the uh, British and French. Then there was a Muslim resistance movement that emerged in what is today Turkey in Anatolia. And that was led by the same Mustafa Kemal. It wasn't a Turkish nationalist movement, it was a Muslim nationalist, uniting Kurds and Turks and other Muslims against the Sultan uh, eventually, when he seemed to be a traitor, they determined he was not on their side, and also against the foreign occupying powers. Now, these men were some of the same men who had annihilated the Armenians. But the leaders had fled to Berlin, actually. So just finish, we've got just three more minutes. Um, just a picture of the, of the last Sultan and what happens to him, and also the final link with his, his daughters and Hyderabad, looping back to India again. Ah, okay. Well, the, um, you know, the final Sultan, finally 1922, uh, Mustafa Kemal and his Muslim uh, revolutionaries are able to defeat and expel the foreign occupiers and also to be acknowledged as the, the, the sovereigns of the land and not the Sultan. They put the Sultan on a, he's, he's, he's escorted to a British ship and he sails away to Malta. Um, now, then the, the, this is 1922, within a year, the new Turkish Republic would be established, but already in 1922, the, um, the assembly, controlled by Mustafa Kemal and the revolutionaries would end the dynasty. They would, they would expel all members of the dynasty, take over all of their property. They also would separate the office of the Sultan, the dynasty, from that of the Caliphate. So since the 16th century, after the Ottomans had conquered um, Mamluk Egypt, the, um, beginning with Suleiman, Sultans had proclaimed themselves to be not only Sultan and Caesar and Khan, but also be the Caliph the leader of the Sunni Muslims of the world. 
So, so in 1922 or in, in thereabouts, they separated the office of Sultan from Caliphate. So then there was still a Caliph in Turkey, but in 1924, they abolished the Caliphate as well. And the Indian connection is, of course, that Muslims in South Asia were outraged. They were outraged that the, these Kemalists, these, these, these revolutionaries, had, had gotten rid of a, an esteemed, if symbolic, a uh, figure for the entire Sunni Muslim world. Um, and it, there's a lot of, a lot of, um, has been written about Indian the, the, the education. Kind of that's here. That's and right. then, then the final Sultan goes to Nice, goes to France, and he, he effectively sells or his nieces or his daughters to the Nizam of Hyderabad. Is that correct? Or does it, that a I, don't I don't know. I don't know that. But the, but the final Caliph, though, wants to come back he goes to Arabia and he wants to come back to um, Turkey as a caliph, but it, it, it doesn't work. It, it, they, the, the new regime really does end the sultanate, the dynasty, and really does end the, the caliphate. It, it's a terrific gallop you've given us through through 500 years of history. We can't possibly do uh, justice to your magnificent book, but I would urge anyone that has their curiosity piqued by this talk to uh, grab uh, uh, Mark's book. It's a, it's a most spectacular, uh, uh, very accessible, but also very scholarly book. You get a wonderful picture of him working away in the top Capi archives and seeing the, uh, the Piri Reis map as it's uh, uh, displayed next door. And, uh, uh, and, and, and also, as I say, the way that this interacts with Indian history at many levels and at many different times, both in terms of uh, actual Ottoman operations on the Indian coast through to diplomatic relations and parallels with the Mughals. So I highly recommend this. Anyone that's been interested in uh, Mughal history uh, will find many, many parallels and, and, and points of interest here in, uh, in Ottoman history. So thank you so much for, uh, for giving us the time and I hope you'll come back in person uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and give us another talk next year. Well, thank you for the conversation. I hope to be able to, uh, to visit Jaipur. Thank you, Mark David Bay and William Dalrymple for that illuminating account of the history of the Ottoman Empire. The session is presented by the Hawthorne Trust. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Do stay tuned to continue to watch the wonderful sessions and the JLF Writer Shorts, all of which have been specially curated for you.